Art changes the world one perception at a time. Candle Gears. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the third talk of the Tehran Summit. My name is Afar Yathi. I'm an artist and researcher based in Tehran and one of the curators of the Tehran Summit. The Tehran Summit creates an alternative way of looking at the process of art making and rejects the monopolization of art by art institutions. The, art, the Tehran Summit is a bridge between Iran's art community and artists around the world and brings together different contemporary discourses and methods of art making utilized by contemporary artists. The Tehran Summit emerges out of a need for independent and artist run events initiated by independent art practitioners in a climate heavily affected by art institutions and commercial galleries. In addition, the Tehran Summit runs on zero budget. It is an accelerationist and a speculative idea to signify that even living under the condition of capitalist realism and a hierarchical atmosphere created by art institutions, there are still uncountable possibilities. Thank you. That's all. Hello, this is Gazelle. Um, an artist based in Paris and Tehran, Ghazali Rakhbein Persian, Gazelle, everywhere else. Um, so thank you, Kendall, for being with us online from Brussels. Uh, I'm going to introduce Kendall Gears. Kendall Gears was born in Germiston, South Africa, and into a working class Afrikaans family during the height of the apartheid. Kendall Gears quickly found himself fighting a crime against humanity on the front lines of activism and protest. From his strong experiences as a revolutionary, he developed a psychosocial political practice that held ethics and aesthetics to be opposite sides of the very same coin, spinning upon the tables of history. In his hands, the discourse of art history is interrogated. Languages of power and ideology, sorry, ideological codes subverted. Um, expectations smashed and belief systems transformed into aesthetic codes. Describing himself as a animistic activist, Kendall Gear's work embodies a syncretic approach that weaves together diverse Afro-European traditions from animism and activism to al alchemy, mysticism, and ritual magic. His strategies are, with, strategies are without compromise because he believes that art changes the world one perception at a time. Gears has shown his work around the world. Uh, the recent exhibitions, I'm going to say now a selection, are at La Cité Internationale des Arts Paris, Kunstmuseum Wolfsburg, Lombard Collection in Avignon, work at Planet B Climate Change and the New Sublime Palazzo Bolani in Venice. Joseph also shows at Carpenters Workshop Gallery Paris in 2022, Capital C Amsterdam 2021, Institut Supérieur de Beaux-Arts Besançon, M77 Gallery in Milan, Milan in 2020. And apart from that, uh, Kendall has been in many international, important international shows, such as Documenta, Documenta 2017-2002, the Venice Biennial 2017-2007, Shanghai Biennial 2016, um, I'm getting there, <laughs> Biennial of Sao Paulo 2010, and many uh, important museums worldwide. For example, he also showed at the Haus der Kunst in Munich, there was a selection of contemporary art from Saint Pompidou. So this is uh, Bloody Hell, uh, the, the piece that Kendall created uh, the first time that he came back to Africa in 1990, uh, in which he sort of washes himself with his own blood. The reason that this piece was um, so sort of captured my mind and um, really liked it and I wanted uh, to talk about it is that um, uh, Kendall Gears um, have, has always dealt with uh, his uh, identity, uh, where he comes from, who he is, and this whole idea of re reinventing identity has, has uh, always been a recurring theme uh, throughout his art career. And in this piece, we see that he's using 
uh, his own blood as uh, some sort of uh, exorcism of his own uh, uh, cultural heritage. At the same time, um, uh, you in one of your interviews, you talked about this whole idea of like shamanism and do, do, uh, shaman doctor uh, versus Western doctor. And when you go to Western doctor, they give you a, uh, like a drug, but the shaman doctor would eat the drug himself to make you, to cure you. Mm -hmm. In a sense, I, I can see um, similarities because you are doing the same, you're, you're putting yourself in, into this hardship to make something happen in the outside. Do you, do you uh, can you elaborate on like these things that, I don't know, I think these are, these are some interesting, uh, this is an interesting piece and um, I thought, uh, that we relate to, please, as well. I mean, this is a fantastic piece to to begin the discussion with. Uh, there's a slightly more violent version of the same of the same performance, um, which is the version I tend to prefer because um, this one's a little bit too beautiful. But um, so I need to explain a little bit about the background of how this work comes into existence. I mean, it's a performance, and then the, the what exists left over is the photograph. Um, and um, so essentially, I was born into a working class uh, Afrikaans family during the height of apartheid, um, which meant that I was born into precisely that cultural subject for whom apartheid had been invented. I was the person that was, you know, not me personally, but my culture, my class, my race, my, 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 my gender, was precisely um, the, 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 that which benefited most from the apartheid regime. And of course, like every kid, um, one goes to school, one goes to church, one obeys one's parents, one obeys the law. Um, and without knowing it, what's going on is that you're being indoctrinated, you're being educated, you are becoming a good citizen. Um, you're becoming a good um, church going, law abiding um, member of society. Um, and let's say normal common sense, um, you know, all these, these, these words that we use to describe um, people at large, um, the moral majority specifically. And the point about the story that I'm going to try to explain is that the, the system was so complete and totalitarian that the ideology erased itself. Um, and essentially, I was put into a conundrum at a certain point when I was more or less 12 years old, when I started to ask questions, I asked the wrong questions, and I got beaten up for asking the wrong questions. That then eventually accelerated until by the time I was 15, I ran away from home in order to um, literally um, start my life alone, independent, leaving my father. My mother left when I was five. Um, but so basically running away from my father and starting again. And in that process, becoming an anti-apartheid activist, um, I was on the front lines, literally fighting the police, fighting the regime, fighting the fascism, and ended up with a trial for treason that um, would culminate in a six year prison sentence. And I decided to go into exile as a refugee, as a, as a war resistor. I ended up in London and then from London, I ended up in New York. Um, and eventually it was less than a year because um, I, I went to London in the end of 1988 and then um, basically, towards the end of 1989, I started receiving messages from other anti-apartheid activists that the end was coming. Um, and I was able to return to South Africa because Mandela, Nelson Mandela, one of his prerequisites for coming out of jail is that everybody who had not committed any crimes like murder or, or, or putting bombs, all of those criminal records had to be erased. So I could return to South Africa without having a criminal record. Um, and I went back to South Africa after I'd spent a year basically working as an assistant to Richard Prince. And you arrive back in the country, I call it the country of my skull to quote Anki Kroch, the country of my birth, 
the revolution was over, we won. I was on the side of the good people. Um, but suddenly, all of those things that I had been taught by my father, by my church, by my school, by the police, by the government, basically by every higher authority or institution was a crime against humanity and illegitimate. My culture was illegitimate, my language was illegitimate, my heritage was illegitimate. And I realized that the only way for me to continue would be to give birth to myself, to start again, to give myself a new name, to give myself a new, I eventually gave myself a date of birth. But the, the, the point being that all the, the, the classic um, keys that one has to, to one's place in the world, one's language, one's culture, I didn't have. And I had to literally start again. And I decided for this particular performance, so it's called Bloody Hell, which is a, a, a kind of a reference to a poem called Invictus, which is one of Mandela's favorite poems of those of you who have seen the film um, about the rugby. I mean, I lived through that World Rugby World Cup and it's pretty, it was a very close to what the film was about. And there's a line that says, my head is bloody but unbowed. And this idea of never surrendering and the idea of you know, maintaining one's faith regardless of the struggle or the adversity. Um, but it's also very important that I need to mention that during the anti-apartheid struggle, so which essentially I entered the anti-apartheid struggle more or less from 1984 through until I, I'm sent into exile at the end of 88, um, were extremely violent years. Um, there were states of emergency. There's a photograph taken by Kevin Carter of me on the front page of the daily newspaper being arrested by the police. Um, but my position in South Africa was not that of a pacifist. It's very important to, to, to make that point um, because there were two schools of thought at the time. There was, we need to be pacifist like Gandhi or like Mandela, who was not a pacifist or Malcolm X, where we literally, to quote Malcolm X, liberate our minds by any means necessary. Um, and I was very much advocating that if you fight a devil, you need to speak the language of the devil. Um, and so this performance was a way of coming back and giving birth to myself. And I decided to do it in the garden of Gandhi. Um, so the apartheid government had not recognized Gandhi as being anybody important. I think, as you know, he spent a lot of time in South Africa at a very important moment in his life. Um, and his house where he had lived in Johannesburg had fallen into ruin and was being squatted by some friends of mine. And I went with a, yeah, with a friend of mine, uh, uh, extracted my blood and I bathed myself. I washed myself in my own blood. It was a process of trying to give birth, but trying to cleanse myself, but trying to also pose the question, could I escape my ancestors? Could I escape my whiteness? Could I escape my maleness? Is there any way that I could wash away my identity? Is there any way I could become something different than what I was born to become. Um, so, you know, it's an admission of guilt, but at the same time, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a baptism by fire because I needed to transform in order to become part of the new democracy that was being created, um, to participate in the new, the new country. Um, and the war was over, so how do we start? So we start like that. For me, it was a ritual bathing, it was a baptism. Um, a cleansing as it as it be. Kendall, uh, and because I mean, because of your uh, Christian background, how come this cleansing wasn't with water? Because <laughs> is it the well, reference to the violence in, in South Africa, the blood? Yes, of course, it's a reference to the violence. Um, it's also a reference to there. There was a. The history of apartheid is, is, is a terrifying history, um, which, is, which cannot be simplified. Um, so essentially the, the Dutch settlers arrive in 1652, and then in 1820, the British arrive. The British buy South Africa for 1 million pounds from the Dutch. And the Dutch who had been there since 1652 say, wait a minute, this is our country. You can't colonize us as if they respected the people that they colonized before them. And then they set out in ox wagons and go into the interior of South Africa. And in that process, of course, they encounter indigenous people 
and all kinds of wars break out and skirmishes and the struggle between the Boers, the Afrikaners who become the Boer, the Dutch who became Afrikaners, who call themselves Boers, which was a farmer. Um, and there's a very particular battle where, which is extremely um, historical in which the Boers, there were, I think, I can't remember the number, but a hundred and something Boers who were camped between the fork of two rivers, fast flowing rivers with hippopotami in the river. Now, for those of you who have spent time in Africa, you know that hippopotami can be extremely violent and aggressive. And they were being attacked by something like 10,000 Zulu warriors. Um, and the Boers basically prayed to God and said, dear God, protect us from these um, people, uh, these heathen savages attacking us. And what happened was the Zulus were trying to cross this fast flowing river. So they couldn't go very quickly. And Shaka had done something which had changed the, 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 the spear from a long throwing spear to a short stabbing spear, which meant they had to really be in front of their enemy in order to attack. And in the meantime, the Boers were shooting people with, with, their, with their guns. And they also had a cannon, which was shooting essentially was like, like a shotgun, shooting um, shrapnel. And they killed so many Zulus that the, the water turned red. And it became known as the Battle of Blood River. There was so much blood shed that day that the waters turned red. And it became known as the Day of the Covenant in, his, in history. And it was in this day that the Boers decided that the reason why they won was because God had chosen them as God's chosen race. Rather than saying they had superior military technology, rather than saying that they had an advantage in terms of where they were, uh, where the, the, the rivers, rather than saying that they won simply because of um, an unfair advantage, they decided God had chosen them. And on the basis of that, they believed that God chose them above um, people of color. And as a child, for instance, I was taught there was a Bible, there's a biblical scripture saying that um, God condemns the mud races. Now, there is no such scripture. There was a scripture invented by the church um, to justify apartheid. Um, I, there was no reference to it anywhere except in the imagination of the priests and politicians. Uh, and I happen to have an ancestor who was there at the Battle of Blood River. So my ritual bathing of myself in blood is not coincidence. It is a reference to that horrific battle and posing the question. So it's a, it's a great, great ancestor. Do I carry the sins of that ancestor in my blood or not? It's not so simple. Of course I do. But of course I spent the time during apartheid fighting the police, being an activist, being anti-apartheid. I did everything I could possibly do to be against the system. But at the same time, my skin, my, my, my gender, my, my, my identity, my heritage, my language, my name is, 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 is um, complicit with that history. So the question that I pose with bathing myself in my blood, say bloody hell, is, is it possible to es escape the sins of one's ancestors? Is it possible? And, and this has to be done by blood. This can't be done by water. This has to be done by something um, much more significant than poetic. And it's also important, uh, you know, um, I need to also mention that 19, it was 1990. So the history of apartheid, it begins in 1948 and it ends in 1990. It's exactly the same years as the Cold War, um, not without coincidence. Um, but and yesterday, um, um, Patsy was talking about, uh, you know, art, you know, art is a hammer to smash reality. Um, and it also reminded me, I think it was a uh, um, Brecht who came up with that quote, um, but it reminded me of the quote of um, Adorno, who said, after Auschwitz, there can be no poetry. And in 1990, that was very much my position that after apartheid, there can be no poetry. So art had to be a hammer to smash reality. It had to be brutal. So I could only do that with my blood, not with um, water. So, you know, it's biblical, but it's also um, an eye for an eye biblical, not New Testament biblical. Uh, the next piece is Hanging Pieces, 1993. I think we, Gaza, is it your, the piece that you cho choose or is it mine or we both chose this one? No, you chose this, uh, but uh, I, I agreed because of the brick, which is uh, 
I think one of the weapons you use, uh, it's a weapon and it's one of your, yeah. um, I can't say found object, lost objects. I lost think. objects, yeah. Uh, Kendall is not just an artist, but uh, he also writes amazing uh, essays and articles and he has uh, so many amazing uh, terms like terror realism and relational ethics as opposed to uh, relational ethics and um, lost objects as opposed to uh, what Marcel Duchamp calls uh, uh, found objects. Uh, this piece is, a, is one of those pieces that reminded me of these two terms. And I was wondering if you can uh, sort of elaborate on these two terms and uh, how they can, uh, these two terms can apply to uh, these pieces and in general, your whole art practice. In fact, the image you're showing now is um, it's an installation made out of two pieces. It's two installations together. Yeah. So yeah. This essentially, is a more it, contemporary one. It, this this yeah. happened in 2022, I guess. Yeah. No, last it was in 2020. 20, so last, yeah. 20 or 20. Yeah. In, in, I, it was an installation. I decided to bring two pieces together. So in the foreground, you see a work called Hanging Piece from 1993. Um, and in the background, you see Neon Signs, which is from 2003, so 10 years later, which is from an installation called Terror Realismus. Um, and let me speak first about the, the hanging piece. So, as I said earlier, um, following the idea of, of, of Adorno, there'll be no poetry after Auschwitz. My challenge was um, returning to South Africa in 1990. What kind of a language would be appropriate for an artist in the aftermath of a crime against humanity? So we had the massive um, crash of ideology. The apartheid system crashed. And I did say that it was important to note that it was part of the Cold War. And that will come back again and again and again um, as, as, we, as we speak. Um, but in the exorcism of the language of apartheid, in the exorcism of um, the, 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 the languages of art that I needed to, that I felt appropriate to create. I, need, I felt it was important that we don't take um, a language off the shelf of art history and regurgitate it in South Africa. Um, I, I, I believe the need was to interrogate the history by, by making art, I, I use the word terror realism, but by using my life experience as an activist, as a revolutionary, and try to use that experience to, to reanimate art. As a, you know, and the, the classic example would be Carl Andre's bricks sitting in the Tate Museum, I think it's called Lever, um, a pile of bricks on the floor of the Tate um, Modern or the Tate Museum. And it sits there in art, a minimalist icon, it was radical in, in as much as in the 1960s, it was calling to question capitalist aesthetics. It was radical to begin with in the sense that it was breaking away from the aesthetics of um, 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 line, form, tone, color, and, and create, inserting something industrial, something um, which at the time was called a ready-made or a found object, um, and challenging our notions of beauty. Um, but however, you know, 20 years later, 30, 40 years later, that pile of bricks becomes an icon of capitalism. It becomes an it becomes a commodity fetish in as much as its value is about its price and its location. But in terms of its challenge, it's pretty much dead. Um, and the, the thing about minimalism that increasingly is clear to me is that minimalism really became synonymous with certain kinds of lifestyles. It's really the lifestyles of the rich and famous because let's face it, um, a pile of bricks only looks good in an empty space. And an empty space can only function if you have a lot of money. Most people cannot put a pile of bricks into their, into their living room or, or their house because they don't have the luxury of space and, 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 and financial ability to be able to do that. But what I wanted to do was bring the brick to life. And so I decided to, I made a lot of bricks at that particular time. And this specific one, um, it's called Hanging Peace. Um, peace as in a piece of cake or peace as in a gun or a weapon. It's a, you know, the idea of a weapon that's hanging. Because 
93 was one year before the election, three years after the end of apartheid. And peace was very much peace as in um, yeah, um, um, peace, peacefulness was very much in the balance in South Africa. And there was a lot of bombs going off. The extreme right wing was dropping bombs. I mean, there were the, the country was at war with itself. It was essentially a civil war. Um, and in the balance of power that was being contested, I wanted to conceive of works of art as weapons of transformation. The work of art is a way of shifting perception by being a bomb that explodes inside our imagination, a bomb that explodes inside our heads. Um, and so the form was taken from a anti-apartheid um, 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 weapon, which was low economy. And that was just, I, I, it's just important to say that I had no money at the time. Um, and so I wanted, I was making a lot of art that cost me zero. And so what would happen was people would, activists would suspend rocks from underneath bridges over freeways. And it would sit at the level of a car windscreen. And so when people were speeding from Johannesburg to go on holidays on the countryside, they would, they would be speeding and then they would hit the brick and that would create enormous damage. Um, and what always fascinated me was the, it was this acceleration or the speed of the person traveling that created the damage, not the object. So it was, the object was inert and it was the, 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 the several meeting, the unlikely meeting of velocity against stationary that creates the damage. And so this piece then, you know, it's, it's essentially in a room and the majority of bricks are around head level. Um, some are a bit tall, some are a bit short because it has to, we have to average out people's height, but it essentially goes from groin to just above the head. And you walk through this, this, this wave, this, this mass of bricks, which are motionless. But once you enter the space, the bricks start moving. And the bricks, and, and the quicker you go into the space, the more the bricks move. So the, the, the greater your acceleration, the greater your way of engaging with the work, the more the, the bricks start to, to, to shift and move. And then they became dangerous, not for you, but for the person behind you. So it's a way of taking Carl Andre and it gets animated by the presence of a human being. It gets animated by the presence of people. And bear in mind that there are also hangman's knots and the brick is red clay, which is, you know, it's a very specific biblical metaphor once again. Um, and then in the background, terror realismus from 10 years later, you see two words there. The third one you can't see, but it's the word danger, terror, and border. Now, what's so terrifying is from 2003 until today, nothing has changed. We're still dealing with those three things, terror, danger, and border. Except the first letter of each is broken, where it's going on and off, flickering. So terror becomes error, danger becomes anger, and border becomes order. And that, you know, that was really about, so in the same way as I'm taking the language of minimalism, the language of um, Carl Andre, the language of an art historical moment, and I'm trying to create an exorcism to make it political, to make it human, to make it emotional. Um, it's the same with language. So I'm taking three simple words, and then suddenly you realize inside a word is another word that is connected. So terror is connected to error. Border is connected to order. We use borders to create our order. We, dang, danger is connected to our anger, to our rage. Um, and how we negotiate those emotions in order to construct our sense of reality um, within language. And language can be verbal or nonverbal. Verbal as in words or nonverbal as in um, Carl Andre's bricks. I was wondering if there's a specific uh, symbol, symbolism to the number of the bricks, or no. is it just X number of bricks, um, depending on the space? Yes, there's the, the, you know, the, the thing about the bricks is that they, um, it, it's sometimes a difficult work to install um, because the bricks need to fill the entire space. Um, and the distance between the bricks is less than shoulder width. You should not, and it has to be random, you should not be able to walk through the space without setting the bricks in motion. Um, so, you know, it, it has to fill the entire space. We have your self-portrait, 
uh, that you made out of a broken um, Heineken bottle. It says um, from Holland, uh, best the the original quality, right? Yes. So why this is a this is a self portrait for you? Well, you see, again, I mean, it goes back to um, the 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 earlier work of Bloody Hell. Is how much are we complicit in our narrative? How much of what we are is a narrative? It's a blue, an ideological bl blueprint that predates us. Um, we're born into, every one of us is born into a system. Every one of us is born into a culture with parents. Um, we're educated in languages and values. We're, we naively as children believe that what we're being taught is right. And as we get taught right from wrong, we create our value system. Now, if that value system is a crime against humanity, can you escape it? If that, crime, if that value system is not a crime against humanity, how much of it is legitimate to maintain for who you want to be, for who you want to become, and how much of it might be, um, need to be adjusted, shifted and changed? Um, and so I've made many works about using my body over the years, but this is the only work of art I've ever, ever made called self-portrait. And what you're seeing is a broken bottle of Heineken beer. Um, and the, the, the label, it's a, it's a South African bottle, so a Heineken in big red letters imported from Holland, and then in small letters, the original quality. And it's called self-portrait because I'm not unlike the broken bottle. My family, my culture, my language, my ideology, my value system is Afrikaans, which is a form of Dutch imported from Holland. However, once it got to South Africa, things shifted and changed and it became indigenous. Um, and the beer was the spirit. The beer was, was exiled, it was drunk. And you end up with a, bro a bottle left over, which then gets broken. And from more or less any point of view, this object is entirely useless. There's nothing you can do with a broken bottle except stab somebody. Um, you might be able to smoke marijuana in it, but it's largely useless. It cannot be recycled. It cannot be upcycled. It cannot be anything except what it is, with the exception of being able to be transformed into a work of art. Um, and that fascinates me to be able to then take this piece of garbage and transform it into a work of art. And in that same process, speak about the history of South Africa. You know, the, the Dutch who were there um, in 1652 were not working for the government of the Netherlands. They were, it was a corporation. It was the Dutch East India Company. They, were, uh, they set up South Africa as a, as a halfway station between the Netherlands and the East Indies in order to get fresh food, fresh water, and wine. Um, and they set it up as a, as, as, as a way to make the corporation more efficient. Um, the corporation became so rich and so powerful, it was the Amazon of its day, that it opened the first stock exchange in the world, the, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. And it is, even by today's standards, the richest, the most wealthy corporation that ever existed. And a lot of their profits was also about slavery. Now, this garbage that I that I that I then you know refer to myself as, a, as again it's an exorcism of my identity by by trying to examine what it is that I was born to become and how I can break the bottle and use the bottle as a weapon to cut myself away from the destiny to cut myself away from um, yeah the, the the narrative the the ideological narrative that I was born into. Um, and it's also important to mention that in declaring a bottle of Heineken beer, a broken discard of, of capitalism, a lot of people assume that I like Heineken beer. And so when I travel around the world, people offer me a bottle of Heineken beer. I don't like Heineken beer. I actually can't stand it. Um, it's, it's a terrible taste. It's not my preferred beverage. I prefer wine. Um, but, and I also chose it for that reason. It's about self-loathing. You know, being born a white South African man is not something you want to be born. There is a self-loathing implicit in the construction of that identity. Uh, it's an awkwardness. It's a, it's it's a, it's a it's an un, it's it's a form of torture. Um, you know, which is you know, I made another work called Rack, which is um, basically broken Heineken's on Duchamp's um, um, bottle rack, 
you know, and rec is a torture instrument. Identity for me is a torture. It is something that's painful. It's something that, that is, is complex, um, something which is inescapable, but which demands um, healing. But uh, Kendall, well, when you tell your story and that you were a revolutionary and an activist and on the front line, and you call this a self-portrait before seeing it as garbage and as your self-loathing thing, me as a spectator, I, I see it as a weapon. I can see you use this as a weapon against the system at that time. Absolutely. I mean, that art is a, art is a weapon. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a powerful weapon. It's a weapon yeah. of perception, but, but my work very often is a physical weapon. You know, the, the bricks can be dangerous. I mean, the, you know, the, the, if you're at the wrong end of a broken bottle, it can be dangerous. Um, you know, it's, the, it's not, I'm, I'm not speaking of defeat and resignation. Indeed, there's, a, there's an activism in my activism. I mean, it is a, an embracement of um, languages of subversion and challenge, to challenge um, um, languages, to challenge um, constructions of power, to challenge, um, our readings and and you know there's also when I say it's a it's a it, you know I like the word refuse it's a piece of refuse because in English you can also say refuse you know and refuse is also you break it up into two words is to put the fuse back but also to refuse something to 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 object to something but it remains a piece of garbage you know the great thing about this work of art is you know I'm extreme it became extremely iconic art historically but it cost me nothing to make. And I love that. It cost me absolutely zero. I took the pleasure, drank the beer, broke the bottle, and there it is, like a football hooligan. Okay. So the next slide is the piece that you made for Palace to Tokyo after taking a year sabbatical, thinking uh, about who you are, thinking about what, the, what art means to you, and uh, there are these like all these like um, <clears throat> points in your life that you're just trying to reinvent something. And that's one of the pieces that comes as the, the, like the consequence of one of those uh, like um, process of thinking about and reinventing and uh, recreating. Um, can you talk more about uh, this piece? I mean, the, you know, the, the, this question of, the, we're living in a time of enormous acceleration. Um, you know, and I, I, I find myself returning again and again and again to the drawing board, as it were, go back to the studio and, 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 and start again. Um, but, you know, the, in the year, basically, but halfway through 2000 to, until 2001, um, I went through an enormous um, sabbatical challenging moment because, um, you know, the world I was born into was the Cold War. It was very easy. You had capitalists and communists. Um, I was fighting against the party. It was very easy. You had fascists and, and, and activists. Um, it was simple. It was either or. Um, life was, was, was easy when, um, if one has a good sense of oneself, it's not difficult to choose which side you're going to be on in such a discussion. Um, but of course, you know, with all kinds of things happening, these things have shifted and changed. And um, and in uh, in in it was in the year halfway through the year 2000, I was on an exhibition in Sonsbeek, in an exhibition called Sonsbeek in Arnhem, in which I um, essentially. Um, I was invited by Jan Hut, who had been a documentary director, to create a work of art using working with the local community, working with the city, and something that was site specific. Now, Arnhem had been in the Second World War bombed, and there's a film called A Bridge Too Far made about Arnhem. And because both the, 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 the Allies and the Nazis wanted control of the city, because who controlled that bridge crossing the Rhine had the advantage, strategic advantage. And the city was essentially flattened. And then a new city was built after the war, which is a horrible um, um, city of horrible uh, architecture. Um, and but so I decided, I mean, based on, on certain experiences working with Jan Hut, um, 
and trying to address his um, gender politics. I created a work which is called Truth or Dare Janhut. And the work was, I gave him a telephone number of a dominatrix in the city. And it's a city of conflict. So I said, the conflict is about a power relation and about his masculinity and what I perceive to be his abuse of power, abuse of power. And I was an African artist. And so I wanted to reverse the power relation. And he would go to the dominatrix, take off his clothes, and she was going to whip him and spank him and torture him. Um, I did not want to make scandals because I wanted the work to be a sincere interrogation rather than something made for um, shock value. So I didn't record him. What I did was I recorded every sound he made. So you hear the sounds of him being spanked, the sounds of him being tortured. You hear him crying. Um, and I presented that at Sonsbeek. Um, that was my installation. Uh, and on the day of the opening, I was supposed to have breakfast with the Queen of Holland and Jan Hut and the curatorial team. And I didn't wake up because I fell into a deep, deep fever. And I ended up um, dragging myself, I was living in London at that time, dragging myself back to London. And I ended up going to see a doctor who could not diagnose me, but gave me penicillin. And I said, are you crazy? I mean, I, I, I took a look at the, the, the prescription and I, I burst out laughing. I was like, okay, if you have a headache, they're gonna give you aspirin. And if you have something else, they're gonna give you penicillin. I threw the, I threw the prescription in the garbage. And I concluded that what I was suffering from was a loss of faith. Up until that point, I'd put, I'd exploded bombs in museums. I tortured curators. I put electric fences in museums. I'd done all kinds of things. Um, and in a way it had become too easy to be an artist. And I needed to revisit my conception of art in order to make it more, to open it up to other things um, that I might not have been ready for. And decided to spend one year as in 12, calendar months, 12 months, um, doing nothing except reading, researching, taking time out to try to restore my faith, try to create a reason to be an artist um, and trying to create a work of art that would justify me calling myself an artist. And I had at the time, I was part of the, the, the opening, um, uh, let's say family of the Palais Tokyo with Jean Sons and Nicolas Borgio in Paris and I had committed to an exhibition and I told them that I would give them the sum total, the consequence, the conclusion of one year of research, the justification for me being an artist. And you're looking at it now, it's called the terrorist, the, the work has two titles. The exhibition was called Sympathy for the Devil and the work of art is called The Terrorist Apprentice. And literally what I presented in the Palais Tokyo, the the Palais Tokyo was empty. The space was empty. And in the center of the space was a base. And inside the base was this the single matchstick. It's a matchstick, it's not bronze, it's not special. It's a generic matchstick called the Terrace Apprentice. And that summed up my, yeah, it summed up, that was the, the conclusion of um, that year of research. I think I read uh, in one of your sites of one of your galleries that it's as of 2003 that you became more spiritual. I mean, brought spirituality into your work. Well, yes, I mean, you know, that year... is that when you invented animist? Pardon me? No, animistic activist as a term comes much later. Um, 2003 is the year of okay. terrorismus. Um, you know, the you know, the, it's it's not a case of um, Saul walking down the road and having a blinding light and changing his name to Paul. I mean, these things are more complex than that. Um, but that year, that sabbatical year, certainly, you know, it was a year in which I studied tarot, Kabbalah, um, you know, all kinds of esoteric systems, um, alchemy. Um, and, but also it's, it's you know, it, it sounds much more um, um, complex than it is in reality, because it's really about taking the, the old Cold War politics of um, good and bad, but also understanding that we have bodies, we have spirits, and integrating them within a holistic concept. It's a case of you know 
how do we take our politics and our conceptions of democracy, but also understand, and now we're certainly living in 2022, you understand that the climate is directly connected to how we live. And, you know, it was in, when, in 2000, when I had the, 2001, when I was going through this process, it was a case of trying to think of art as something holistic and inclusive, um, something which, which includes my emotions, but also my spirit. Um, and I found, you know, for instance, you know, tarot was extremely helpful for me, you know, because the, in order to understand the tarot, you need to understand astronomy, astrology, um, archaeology, symbolism, um, you know, it, it's, it's about where, and, and what saves me was the idea was that the work of art needs to be more than the sum total of its parts. The work of art needs to be more than a pile of bricks on the floor. A work of art needs to be more than I can imagine. A work of art needs to open the doors of perception, open the doors of consciousness to be able to help me to channel something greater than I am. You know, I'm, I'm, I am flesh and spirit but the process of making art is so much greater than just this body, than just this voice. To be able to open my consciousness, to be able to allow myself to be part of the universe, part of the nature, um, rather than thinking myself above it. There's a huge arrogance that we have where artists think that they need to be in control of nature rather than participating in nature. So, you know, the Eteros of Prince, I can speak about this work for ages. I mean, it's a piece of wood but wood comes from trees, you know? So it, it, it's, it's not so simple as just a piece of wood in a museum. It comes from, and you know, the work was also inspired by um, the Yates, um, you know, and the idea of you strike the match because, you know, the great fire of London began with a match, with a spark. It's about, you know, the terrorist apprentice is obviously a pun on the sorcerer's apprentice. Everything begins with a spark and that spark might be metaphysical, but that spark might also be physical. So what this work embodies is the shift from the political spark of change to also the metaphysical spark of change, which is about a change of consciousness. And of course it's phallic with its tiny little red phallus, um, you know, made of, you know, the, the, the gunpowder at the end. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a wooden penis um, that is unlit and it sits there with infinite potential. And the second you strike the match, the potential disappears. And then it either becomes a flame or it lights a candle or it just dies. I mean, it's, you know, it's, 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 it speaks so much about our human condition, about its own infinite potential until we actually try to start the fire. And then, you know, very often it just dies. Uh, so then the next slide is this piece that you made. Uh, it says director's caught. Uh, you showed this in documenta 14. Um, it's the piece that I chose. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, find any, um, I don't know, like descriptions about the piece, but I really like the idea of putting like situation, fencing and still shells in it. Well, so what you're looking at there is essentially um, in, in, in South Africa, we call it razor mesh. Um, in Germany, it's called NATO draht, NATO wire. Um, essentially, it's border fencing, you know, so remember the earlier work from the year before that said border order. Well, this is another way to say the same thing, border order. And it was a work that was commissioned for a museum in Athens. And I took the idea of the, 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 the Acropolis as, my, as my, my, my starting point, the Acropolis being a temple on top of the, 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 the you know, the, the mountain in, at Athens. Um, but except the columns today are not made out of marble, the columns are made out of security fencing, they're made out of border fencing. Um, and this specific border fencing was invented in South Africa during the apartheid era. It's the one with blades, razor blades, it's not um, barbed wire. And I always, you know, said that barbed wire was made for, is today made for cattle um, and for farms, and razor wire is made for borders. Um, and I always laugh when people say, yes, well, that's a South African, you know, South African problem. If you go to Gardenau in Paris, inside the station in Paris, you will see this fencing separating the Eurostar platform from the rest of the trains in Paris. This is the fences that are around um, borders, airports, hospitals, any zone where you want to keep human beings out is made by this fencing. So now it, it, it looks like a temple, um, it 
presents itself as a temple, but it's a, it's a, it's a storage site um, of borders. Now, the thing about a border that we need to also keep in mind, a border is a bit like language. It's also like the COVID mask. It definitely protects you, but at the same time, it also incarcerates you. The taller your border, the more you're protected, but the more you are in jail. The same with language. Um, and the thing, so you can, you know, you can enter into this work, but you have to, there's the, the, the it's 1.5 meters. So you have to bow down, you go inside, it becomes like a temple, a temple complex, and it's very silent. Um, and you can also become aware of your fragility, surrounded by the border, surrounded by the razor blades. And you can, in that moment, try to think about your body and your body space in relation to which side of the border you're lucky to be on. Um, and the, the title is called Acropolis Redux, and then in brackets, the director's cut, um, which is a, which is a, um, an, an obvious quotation to Apocalypse Now. So you had Apocalypse Now, and then some years later, he made Acro Apocalypse Redux, the director's cut. Um, and because Apocalypse Now is based on a very interesting book, the film is based on the book Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad which is one of the most fascinating books ever written. And this, it tells the story of um, Marlowe, who is also the character from um, uh, who, who, the, the, the person who writes the original Faust. Um, so Marlowe is being sent by a colonial British company to the Congo to go up the river to, to retrieve back a man called Kurtz. So Kurtz has become savage, as they say in the book. He has become native. He was a good company man. They were trading in ivory. They were, tra they were trading in all forms of colonial profit. And somehow Kurtz decides to stop being the good European company man. And he becomes, he changes. Um, he becomes part of the jungle that he's located in. He transforms his personality. He becomes the monster that the company was fighting. And as Marlowe is going up the river, he's reading the diaries of Kurtz. He's, re he's, he's trying to get to know the man so he knows how to, when he finds him, bring him back to London in order to domesticate him, rehabilitize him. But as he's going up the river, and you see it in the film, the, 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 the book describes how the water turns red, how the jungle becomes these shadows. You realize that Marlowe is also having his own psychological experience and he's going traveling into himself is, is becoming part of that process. And there's the wonderful scene from um, Apocalypse Now where in the diaries, you see the, the text, sell the wife, sell the car, sell the kids, I'm not coming home, which uh, Christopher Wool then turned into a work of art. Um, but that's very much what Kurtz wants to do. He wants to get rid of the wife, the kids, the car, everything that ties him to what one might consider civilization. He wants to exorcise. And by the time Marlowe reaches Kurtz, Kurtz is on his deathbed and he has sympathy for Kurtz. He, he empathizes, he cannot condemn him anymore. He actually sits down next to his deathbed and the last word that Kurtz says is the horror, the horror. And the question that I pose to myself is having experienced in South Africa extreme violence, coming from people who are extremely loving is to understand that in fact, you know, it's a circumstance or something that happens in your life that makes you into a monster. You know, Nietzsche says, be careful when you fight monsters, you don't become a monster. He also said, when you look into the abyss, the abyss looks into you. Now, the, 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 when one is in an extreme situation, how does one maintain one's humanity? How does one not flip over to the dark side. You know, it's the classic story of, of Darth Vader. Um, and within every one of us lies the capacity in a certain situation, we could commit evil deeds, no matter how good we think we are today. When our life shifts and changes, we are capable of transforming into something quite dark and sinister. So, the, you know, that's, so that's you know, the, the idea of the Acropolis Redux how faith can also be used, um, the faith that might sustain you um, in the Acropolis at one point can also at another point become your undoing or your unbecoming. 
and 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 one can commit crimes against humanity if one is forced into a situation that is extreme. Uh, you know, I mean, apart from being a temple, it's also that uh, if we walk here, we're sort of, uh, it's an inventory of your, of these um, border wires, and we're not in danger, actually, because it's in a museum space, right? We're not in danger. We see them uh, perfectly, neatly placed in, as, as an inventory in a, on shelves, and um, you know, we, we're not in danger. We see that we could be in danger because, like, with the picture, I, I, I can I mean, I also thought it was like the normal why I, I, I didn't think it would be the razor one. But we, I mean, it's like sort of knowing that it exists and it's there, but we're not in danger. On the contrary, for the, uh, of the the bricks, because in the bricks you put everybody in danger. That, that, you know, that's a very here you don't put anybody in danger unless somebody just takes it unless somebody is Kendall Gears <laughs> and walks into Documenta, takes one, <laughs> throws it at someone. You know what I mean? If somebody is like you who would dare to touch it, dare touch this thing. You know, you know, that's an interesting question. You know, um, when are you when I when I was making works of art um, using this material, razor mesh. Um, it, I would always end up having this exact discussion with a museum or a gallery or an art fair in which I was being told that my work is dangerous in terms of public safety. Um, and I would say, but wait a minute, you're not allowed to touch a work of art. You know, if, if you grab one of those, those, those coils of security fencing with your bare hand, you will bleed. If you grab it like that, you will definitely cut yourself. I know I've done it many times. Every time I install this work, I end up bleeding. Um, but of course, we don't walk into a museum and grab a sculpture. But the, 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 and in many ways, it becomes even more dangerous because it's the, it's the symbolism of danger. Um, it's the potential of danger. It's like the, the terrorist apprentice. It's the potential to burn a city with a match. Um, and I would always have to say, but you know, my sculpture announces its danger which is very different than, let's say, a large photograph, a two meter photograph behind a glass frame, um, which does not announce its danger. And if you run into that glass photograph, you will definitely have more harm to your body than if you, um, um, you know, run into to, to this sculpture. Um, and it is, but the thing is, once you enter into that space, knowing that the sculpture is made of these very obviously dangerous blades, you walk differently. You become self-conscious of your body. You look at your body, you realize your body is made out of flesh. You realize your fragility. You, 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 you change the way you move in the space because of the symbolic violence. So yes, the work is not dangerous in the sense of it's not going to attack you, but you sure as hell are not gonna run into the sculpture. And, you, and you're probably going to, if you have kids, hold them by the hand. And what was interesting is that um, um, a friend of mine, Katerina Gregos, recently became director of the museum in Athens, where this work is permanently installed. And she said to me that because of perceived risk to people, this work was cordoned off so you could not enter it. And she asked me about that. And we had a discussion. I said, it's absolutely imperative that you have the right to be able to enter the work. It's important. That, that, that one is able to confront that danger. Yes, it's no less dangerous than crossing a road in front of a tram line. You take your responsibility. But at the same time, there is a psychological risk when one enters a, an installation like that because, yeah, the glass, you know, the, 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 the blades are, are, are sharp and one needs to not be reckless when entering such a work of art. Next piece is Gazelle's choice, so you can, Gazelle, you can talk about it. For me, my question about this was, um, you know, the arm, you know, in French, arm, weapon, and the weapon, and also the piece, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I don't really want to talk about it, I want you to talk about it, because, um, well, it refers to, to um, 
classical sculpture because it's bo the body, but it's the bits of the body. It's not just any bit of the body, it's the arm that that you takes the arm that uses the arm in French, the weapon. And um, Erfan, could you show the next one? And the other one is the arm that is, can you show the next, are you showing the next one? There are, there are two. And the other one, the arm. Which huh? one? No, back, back. The, the, the other arms, the two arms. Are you showing it? Okay. And the other one, the title, pray, play, pray, pay. Again, it's the arm praying with the, I just want you to, to describe these two pieces because um, they're quite different from uh, the, the other ones we have selected and they're, uh, but at the same time, it's the arm and the, you know, the weapon and. Indeed, I mean, you know, there's, there's a play on words between an arm as in a weapon and an arm as in, and they're not just any arm, they're my arms. Um, they're bronze casts of my arms. Um, so in this one that we're looking at here, it's a bit, it's a bit like a crucifix, um, the two arms, except you know, this chain in between and a chain which conjures images of slavery, incarceration. Um, and the title in advance of a broken arm is the title of a Duchamp work of art, which is the snow shovel. Um, and the, you know, the snow shovel, which, we, which is used to, you know, there's, there's a lot of allusion and um, the idea of um, digging in the ground um, and plowing, which is a very male, masculine, you know, um, 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 process. And I mean, so one of the artists that I take a lot of issue with is Duchamp, and I use, and I interrogate him a great deal. So here you have a very quiet, meditative sculpture um, of my arms with two gestures. So the one gesture is the, the, the gesture which art historically would be um, St. John the Baptist. So it's normally the finger which points up. You see it in the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci. It's where John the Baptist points to Jesus to say, this is the coming of the Messiah. Um, but in this instance, it's pointing to the, what's you call it, the Manufiku, um, which is the, the gesture in Italy, um, in Brazil, in a lot of places around the world, which is a superstitious gesture of the thumb between the fingers, um, which, is, which is a very sexual, eroticized gesture, which in many ways is the equivalent of, um, you know, to, to say fuck, um, to say fuck you, fuck off. Um, and so it's, a, it's you know, the, the gesture is pointing, the, 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 let's say the polite gesture is pointing to the impolite gesture. Um, you might need to zoom in to see it, but, um, and it's, it's a bronze painted white, which is the, the color of, uh, you know, uh, classic Greek sculptures. And, and it's an interrogation of the canons of beauty, the canons of art history, the, you know, a way of taking, so here I'm quoting Duchamp by the title, not by what the work looks like, but, but by what it embodies or represents. Um, and then if you go to the next one, um, so here we have the same process happening. So here we have Dura, you know, the praying hands of Dura. Um, and again, the interrogation with language. So I said earlier that, you know, language was, was, was like a border that it can imprison you or incarcerate you. Um, the difference being that um, the right, the ability to speak as I'm doing is not the same as the right to speak. One can't always speak freely. In many countries in the world, one cannot question the governments, one cannot question hierarchies. Um, on social media today, there's many things one can and cannot say. There's many parts of the body one can or cannot show. Um, so, you know, power and, 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 and the, the ability, the right to speak shifts according to local conditions. So here you have my hands in, 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 in submission, in bronze, handcuffed. And the title is pray with an A, as in prayer, play as in games, pray with an E, as in the victim, as in violence by the state, violence by police, and pay. So you have four words which are homonyms. They sound the same, pray, play, pray. You know, if you say those words together, it becomes a tongue twister. And I put them together so they become, a, it becomes like a neologism um, because how our body manifests our fears and desires, how our body is able to speak without words in which is not sure if the hands of the artist is being forced into submission to pay 
the rent, to pay one's dues, to pay homage, or whether I'm a victim, as in I've been preyed upon, I've been attacked by language, by art history, by the art market, by, or whether I'm having a game, whether I'm being tied up for erotic reasons um, voluntarily in order to enjoy submission. You know, that, the great thing about art is that it gives us the ability to say two things at the same time. It gives us the ability to pay homage to Duchamp, but at the same time, um, kill the sacred cows. We are able to, as an iconoclast, we're able to celebrate history at the same time as burning down the temple. Okay, thank you. Efron, do you have anything? I'm just wondering what's the material of this one because bronze. it should be it's bronze. Yeah. Okay. It's so you bronze. Have... I, mean, I made it in bronze, and so the first one I made a I painted it white because I wanted to invoke the classic tradition of you know make it look like plaster of Paris or make it look like marble, and in this one I wanted to make really the color of um, a bronze sculpture on the street when hydrochloric, when rain, essentially acid rain falls on the sculpture and turns it green. Because the greenness of the copper um, when it's rusting, and I think we'll talk about that in the next work, um, is also to speak about you know, when the, 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 the relationship between our human bodies and the nature, um, a way to link to um, a pollution and, 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 and um, um, yeah, I mean, literally acid rain, which discolors a bronze sculpture to, to look like this, um, black and green. Okay, you're showing the, the face, right? Because yeah. I can't see it. Yeah. Okay, well, well, the title, I don't know what it stands for, you will tell me, but this, um, this work, which we see a lot of you, that you've painted your face and it's from 2013. And okay, the, the pattern fuck is repeated and, um, one of my favorite words, and you use it a lot. But the interesting thing is that the reference to the African mask, because and your identity is because you say you're African and you're white. You're African, you're white. The two identities. And in this, these works, you're you're white and black. Mm. And so you're I'm, referring. I mean, as of I think, is it as of here that you you got closer to? Um, African arts, because I read somewhere that you were talking about African art um, that is um, part of life, as opposed to art in the Western countries. And yeah, I, you, you started making more and more African art, if I may say that. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not that simple. Uh, I always made African art because I've always been an African artist. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the there's a bit of a mistake in the in the yeah I mean in the, the image and the title. Um, there's a this is a slightly different version um, than the title you you're giving. Um, and the original is from this this image that you're looking at is from 2007. Um, and the title is Fuckface. So FFV2 um, is from a version I made in 2013, which is a slightly different version. But so Fuckface is me taking a text, fuck, and painting my face with it. And there are two works I make in 2007 called Fuck Face. One is a human skull painted with this pattern. Another is me. And this, again, is this idea of dying in order to surrender to something, in order to give birth to oneself. Um, and it was very much me trying to interrogate or deal with the, the, the most frequent question I get asked is, you're a white guy, how can you call yourself African? You're a white man, you're not a real African artist. And I don't know what a real African artist is. What I do know is that my family has been in Africa for 300 years. Um, I, I identify as an African artist. Um, and what does that mean? Um, I think I famously said for an exhibition I curated in 2019, the difference between an African work of art and a European work of art is that when you look at an African work of art, it looks back at you because it's alive with spirit. Um, 
in Africa, and I cannot generalize, Africa is a continent of 54 countries with a history which goes all the way back to the origin of the species and includes Egypt. I know a lot of French people like to think that Egypt is closer to France than it is to Africa, but Egypt, ancient Egypt is part of Africa. And the, again, at the risk of generalizing, but African art going back millennia was part of the life that people were living. One did not create museums, one created works of art that was part of your daily rituals, that was part of your, your way of negotiating spirit, life and death, love, fear and disease. Um, one of the, 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 the big inspirations for this work is it's black and white because there's a, there's a, the pende, there's a pende mangu mask uh, from, from, from Central Africa. And this is the mask which has very distorted features. And what a lot of people say that art historians say, Picasso uses the inspiration for Le Demoiselle de Avignon with a twisted face. And one half of the face is black, the other half of the face is white with a vertical mouth. Um, and this is, it's a healing mask, healing against illness. And the reason why half the face is black and half the face is white is because illness is half physical and half spiritual. You cannot cure the body without curing the spirit. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's, that's very much, you know, I always say that art is the, man, is the, the, the uh, spiritualization of matter and the materialization of spirit. And this is a work which is really, it's, it's like trying to use language in a way to unlock consciousness use language in order to create a folk art, a contemporary folk art, in order to speak about the faith that I believe in, in order to embody my um, concept of ethics and aesthetics. Um, because when you look at the F, when you, when you, when you, when you mirror the, 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 the word fuck up and down, the F in the middle makes a cross of Lorraine. Um, it's also the letter F is also the sixth letter of the alphabet. Uh, which you would say a hex and you would use the hex to create a curse. Another way for cursing is hexing. And another way to say fuck is a curse word. It's completely connected. Um, and the reason why I was using fuck for a long time, which I, I've stopped for a lot for now, um, is because for me, fuck was the last magical word. It was the last word which still retained its magical power. Because when you would use the word fuck before, people would have a reaction. Not anymore. That's changed. Today, fuck is on every television channel. It's in every film. It's even at the Academy Awards. What fascinates me when we think about the, the, the Oscars, the story with Chris Rock and, 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 and um, I mean, Chris Rock and, and Will Smith, is when we speak about the slap, the, the, the violence that took place on the stage. But nobody cares that Will Smith said, take my wife's name out of your fucking mouth. You can say that today. It is not blasphemous. It is not her heresy. It is not vulgar. It has become an ordinary banal word. Um, and I always said that when fuck loses its power, it will become a t-shirt and a perfume. In 2020, it became a t-shirt and a perfume. Now, the reason why fuck was powerful and why I called it the magical word is because the point about magic is you can use magic to create and you can use magic to destroy. Magic is determined by your intention. And so if I said, fuck you, it's a declaration of war. It would immediately result in an aggression. It would re result in violence. However, if I say, fuck me, it's a declaration of love. It results in an entirely different um, chain reaction. So the way you would use the word would change the meaning significantly. The same word can be creative and destructive. The same word can be positive and negative, depending on how it gets used. So yeah, I was using a lot of um, the word fuck in a lot of my works in order to question the art market, in order to challenge um, the, the, the borders and the, and, the, and the limitations of art in order to try to reanimate it with a, a different kind of bomb that was more semantic, that was a sem semiotic bomb, rather than the, the, you know, the, 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 the bombs, which was like about hanging bricks. It's so clear. Thank you so much. Efron, do you have anything to ask? 
Uh, not really. What I like, how every single piece is like a teleport to a new world. The candles just brings us, it's amazing. I mean, it's always about language somehow. It's always about how we construct language. And you know, it's my work is disconnected in the sense that I never created a brand of, you know, like these, these works here. I mean, I could have wrapped sculptures in red and white tape forever, and that could have been my brand. But I decided instead to always make my life difficult for myself by, by going to the reason behind why I wrap sculptures in red and white tape. In order to speak about language and symbolism, um, about, about the things we don't see, rather than the, the, the access to the things we do see. So do you have a question about this work? Yes, I'll. Can you see the one? No, no, no. Where are we now? Uh, the Twilight ah. of the Idols is the, the piece uh, that Kendall has wrapped it with uh, red and white tape. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. One question about this, yes. First of all, was that a, uh, I can't, I'm not allowed to say this, was that a found object? It's not, I mean, it's, it's a African indigenous, sorry for the term, as Westerners say, uh, sculptures that you wrapped? Yes, so um, just to then, you know, I, I mean, just to explain to everybody who's listening, um, I, I object to the word found object um, because I find it to be a colonial concept. Um, it reminds me of, you know, when Duchamp says, I find this object, therefore it belongs to me. Um, and if you look at where Duchamp is located in history and, and in time, he, and as, as a European French man, um, the, the values, the, 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 the ethical, moral values that go into Duchamp finding are the same values that go into Christopher Columbus finding or in the case of South Africa, Jan van Riebeck finding. The idea of, I found this country, therefore this country belongs to me, regardless of who was living there before, regardless of the context or the history of that country, it's the white male coming in saying, I found it, it's mine. Um, and so I prefer to shift the signifier from a found object to a lost object, because like in that way, I can work with existing objects existing images, existing things, but at the same time by saying they're lost, it presupposes that there's a life and an origin prior to my involvement with the object. So in that way, I invite the person who's looking, reading, listening, to be able to interrogate, okay, so if this object was lost, therefore the history that predates Kendall's involvement is important. So what is that history? Let's talk about that history. So, you know, if Columbus said, if we spoke about the Americas instead of Columbus, um, finding of the Americas, we can speak about how Columbus got lost in the Americas, and in getting lost, we can speak about the people who were there who took care of him, um, you know, in that process of getting lost. Um, so yes, these are lost objects, um, and the thing about African art is that because African art is um, not made for a, a, a gallery market, is not made, it's, African art is essentially made to be used. It was meant to be embodied, to be danced, to be ritualized, to be used in a, in a, in a sacred or social context. And uh, even until today, um, classic African art is, is authenticated by its patina. So the proof of use in the patina, so it's a bit like my broken bottle that was drunk. Once something has been used, it accumulates value. Um, a brand new carving from in a classical tradition will be useless. But a carving that has lots of scratches and bruises and has been obviously used many, many, many times over has a value. Um, so then by taking danger tape, red and white danger tape and wrapping the object, you can't see the patina anymore. So now you suddenly don't know, is this an authentic work or is it a curio? Is it fake or is it expensive? And you will never know unless you unwrap the sculpture, but by unwrapping the sculpture, you destroy the Kendall Gears work of art. So it becomes then a conundrum about what's underneath, what is, what's really going on. Um, and, you know, the title is Twilight of the Idols, which is the, the book of Nietzsche, um, and poses this question when Nietzsche said, God is dead, uh, what was he really speaking about? And the Twilight of the Idols series of sculptures 
are all sacred objects that is an attempt to restore the value, restore the sacredness to those objects. So by not being able to see the object anymore underneath, now we can speak about what's missing. We can speak about the absence of sacred. We can speak about the absence of um, function of those objects. We can speak about the absence of uh, cultural, religious context in which those objects are no longer, but now end up um, in a secondary market, be it a flea. to smash reality you know the subtitle of Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols which I always loved is um, how to sorry Kendall we'll smash the... um, yeah. okay are you, are you... Yeah, so, I, would... I was saying the subtitle the subtitle of uh, Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols or the second title to that book is how to philosophize with the hammer um, which was you know I was going back to um, Patsy's uh, talk yesterday about art being a hammer to smash reality and sometimes one needs to take something fragile like one of these lost objects um, and wrap them up you know the and then my process is on the one side they're asphyxiated because the, you know they they can't breathe and i've paid attention to the eyes they're blinded the mouths can't speak in order to speak about the unspoken in order to speak about the silence about what these objects might have been and how did they get lost and where did they come from and how could we restore them to their previous social, political or sacred functions? Okay, thank you. One question, Kendall, are you okay with the time still? I'm okay. Is everybody else okay? I don't know if, okay. if everybody- You're okay. <laughs> Okay. Efron, do you have a question or you want to move to the second? Um, the, the I next just one? really like the, the point that you mentioned at the, the start of talking about this piece that you could have uh, made this as some of your, as, as a signature of Kendall Gears and, and sell it like, uh, like what he, what Cavs is doing in New York, like sell all these like dolls and be, be famous and be rich, uh, but you, you rather, you would rather put yourself in this hardship of just why I'm I'm not Nike, I'm not Adidas, I'm not I'm not supposed to like create uh, this series of like productions without even thinking about it. And you're you you come here as the the artist th thinking about why you want to just keep doing what uh, uh, you've been doing before just to sell it, or is that all? Um, is that what art means to you? Yeah, I really like that idea. Well, you know, if I'm going to say my work is about an interrogation of power and power relations, if I'm going to be critical of art systems and art historical languages and constantly try to unwind them and undo them, then surely if I accumulate power myself, or if I accumulate an art historical language myself, surely I should then interrogate myself, which is what I try to do. Um, you know, as soon as my work becomes historical, I also then try to interrogate why. Um, you know, as, as, a, as a young artist, as a young naive um, activist artist, um, I was totally against the idea of being assimilated within the system and, you know, wanted to challenge But once one enters into the system, um, what does one do then? And how does one then interrogate oneself? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you may have picked up a lot of my work has a lot of humor, but it's also a good way to also use humor against oneself. And I think it's, it's important that I maintain the ability to, to laugh at myself as much as I can laugh at Carl Andre. So I don't become, um, you know, I don't end up making the same mistakes of the artist that I, I'm questioning. <laughs> well, uh, well, these police patterns, I, there are many of them in your work. We chose this one because I think it's this one, uh, uh, the, the picture, the portrait, you're behind this one, I think. And well, I, I don't really want to talk about it. I want you to talk about it because, you know, I mean, the, the reference to the cross, the police pattern, the phallic, you know, 
I want you to talk about it. I don't know, uh, but I know that there's many uh, versions of it in bronze and glass. Hmm. There's not that many versions. I mean, it's you know, it's it seems there seems to be more than there really are. Um, so the let's say the, the work begins um, in 2003, where I take a standard um, rubber police baton, two standard, and 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 cover them with gold leaf. And I call that work a rose by any other name, which is coming from Shakespeare, coming from Romeo and Juliet. Um, and Shakespeare says a rose by any other name. And he essentially is saying um, the name doesn't change anything. You can change the name, but it still has sharp thorns and it's still going to be what it is. We can't use euphemism. We can't pretend something is what it isn't. Um, and so then I, I then created, so from the, the, the gold leaf one, I then created the glass ones, which are fragile. So if you use them, they're going to break. Um, and then I create, and then I'm, you know, I have a, a, a small series of different metals. So lead, um, copper. I hope to produce one in solid gold and solid silver, but that's going to take, you know, a, a bigger budget than I have. Um, and each time the title is a play on words um, and alliteration, or so, um, you know. Rose by any other name becomes a lover's shame. And so this one begins as I say, I, I, I couldn't help myself in this instance, because normally it's, you know, for instance, one, the glass one's called purple prose buys another name. Um, purple prose being in you know, a fancy language. But here I decided to only stay true to the form at the end, a lover's shame, which is another name. And then speak about Venus, because in alchemy, um, the, 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 the symbol of um, the, the metal of Venus is copper. Um, and, you know, just as the, the metal of Mars is iron. Um, and the reason why this is important is because when iron rusts, it turns red, which is the color of blood, which is because Mars is the god of war and war is made with iron, swords and, and bullets. And, and in this instance, Venus is copper because it's a, it takes an electrical charge um, because Venus is also the goddess of love. Um, and literally you can get turned on because of the electrical current. And when Venus, when, when copper rusts, it turns green. Yeah. The color of um, grass, the color of, you know. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of games that I'm playing with, 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 with semantics and illusions and references. Um, but essentially these works all arrive at the same point, which is you have two police batons Um, we lost you, Kendall. Is the church created? Did we create the church because we are afraid, or did we, or did the church create our fear? So you know, it's, you know our constructions of good and evil, right and wrong, um, the creator and the destructor, um, the you know, the, the devil and the and the and God. Are these things which are really out there in the universe guiding us or are these just something that our imaginations and our fears give rise to and then did we create politics and a police force in order to stabilize those fears in order to stabilize those um you know those those the the the, the, the structures of um power relations that 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 civil society has been built upon for the last two thousand years um do you do you want uh, to see if anybody has any questions from Kendall? Sure, sure, yeah. we can take questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for all your energy that you have. Hey, Arwan. Hi, um, Kendall. Um, this was uh, a, a truly a privileged <laughs> um, experience. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the generosity um, that that you've given your time to go over this and the past hour and a half has has, has really been um, um, a, a very very valuable experience for me um, for sure um, I wanted to um, ask two things uh, one you mentioned that uh, in 1980 88 when you were in London you were assistant to Richard Price uh, sorry Richard Prince um, how 
how did that experience um, impacted your artistic development? Um, and and the second thing I wanted to say, I, I heard Erfan said that, that you write a lot. Um, is how important is writing? I mean, I noticed that 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 language and and play with language is is a as an integral is an integral part of your work. But but how important do you think is writing for an artist um, as well? So um, yes, I, I I went to London at the end of eighty eight as a refugee. I was I I mean for various personal reasons um, I didn't like the refugee situation there. Um, I then went from London to New York where I was an illegal alien. I, I, I preferred to be illegal in New York than legal in London um, for very personal reasons about my personality. Um, and yeah, then for, and spent that year, I met Richard Prince by coincidence and then I was his um, assistant. Um, and the most, I mean, I, when I arrived in New York, of course, I'd heard of Richard Prince. Um, I had read all the books from, in fact, it was Hal Foster who introduced me. Um, so I, I was basically, um, I had been working with Hans Heike during, during the apartheid era. Um, and I knew Hans Heike through the anti-apartheid movement and Hans Heike introduced me to, to Hal Foster and then ended up meeting um, Richard Prince. Um, and I had these great illusions about this superstar of art history. I mean, he's gone on to become even more important. But the thing that shocked me, surprised me, inspired me, was I realized working with him that he was just a folk artist, nothing more. But he was a folk artist of a little island called Manhattan. And he was representing the values of a small, little, wealthy, powerful community. But but the, the, the principle wasn't the wealth. The principle was he was a folk artist and he was representing Americana, cowboys, and you know, uh, the values of that particular tribe. And it made me say, well, wait a minute. Maybe I should stop feeling embarrassed to be an Afrikaans kid. Maybe, maybe, maybe they have the advantage because they have the power and the money but that doesn't make what they do better. That doesn't make what they do more superior. And maybe I could invest in my culture. So in the same way as he could take his Americana and his cowboys and his, his, his masculinity and translate that into what he does, maybe I could take my struggle as an activist, as a white South African and try to translate that into my language and stop feeling you know, the, you know, the broken bottle that says, you know, the superior, you know, the, the, the superior quality will stop feeling inferior, stop comparing myself to London and New York, stop thinking that, you know, because I come from Johannesburg, I am a second class world citizen, and that what I make is of less value. Um, and so yes, and, and, and um, the, the question of writing, well, you know, it, it's when I went back to South Africa, um, I needed to earn a living, and I don't know how it happened again, a series of coincidences. I ended up working as a journalist um, and ended up writing for the daily newspaper, ended up with a column writing about culture in general and news stories. Um, and in that process, learned the craft of writing. Um, you know, there's, there's something wonderful when you have, a, you have 600 words and a deadline you have to commit and there's no, it's like, and if you don't, if you write 620 words, 20 words are gonna disappear because somebody else is gonna randomly pluck them out. So better you pay attention to the craft of your 600 words. Um, and in that process, created a deep respect for writing. It doesn't come naturally, even to this day. It's not an easy, it's not something I believe I'm naturally talented in doing. I struggle with my writing. But I feel at the end of it, an enormous sense of accomplishment. And it's a bit like, I mean, you've seen some self-portraits. There was the, the fuck face and there was the bloody hell. I mark time when I need to with a self-portrait. Every now and then I take a photo or mold a part of my body to mark the time, to mark the aging process, to, to be observant of what's changing. Kendall Gears today 
is not the same kid from the Cold War. Um, how have I changed? How has my concept of art changed? How And writing is another way for me to do that. I try to at least once, sometimes twice a year, take the time to express what bothers me. Um, so for that, I always love to have a deadline. When somebody invites me, please write a text. Okay, then I'll make the commitment. I need the deadline. Um, and then try to understand, so what am I thinking about climate change? What am I thinking about what's going on in Ukraine and Russia today? What am I thinking about um, Trump? What am I thinking about? And the, the, you know, writing, it's a discipline that forces me to make decisions. I can change my mind, but in this moment, I create a sense of something that I can stand by and believe in. And um, so it's, a, it's marking time, but also it's about creating discipline. Um, and then when I go to the studio, it's also very important that I do not illustrate anything. I don't write a text and think, let me go and illustrate those ideas or vice versa. I will never write about my art. I hate fixing the meaning because I believe it's also important that the works of art, I can speak around a subject, but your interpretation of my work is as important as mine because I want the work to be generous. I can give keys, but I want you to unlock doors um, and that the work doesn't get fixed yet, as in the work is about this or about that. Because as I said, we were speaking about Kurtz and Mahler, we need to be able to speak about our human condition. And we all suffer regardless of where we were born or who we were, who, how we were raised. But we've all had to negotiate that space of politics and faith, that space of parents and education, language, um, and, 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 and the, the ability to speak, the right to speak, the fundamental right to say, who am I? What do I believe in? What do I stand for? It's not easy. It's very complicated. So yeah, writing helps me to, it just helps me to, force myself to make decisions otherwise i will forever procrastinate which is i think you know i think that's the curse of being an artist one one inevitably procrastinates um you know thanks there, yeah, uh, there is a there is a uh, vida has a question in the comment section it says uh, she says uh, since not everybody has your background to grasp all the symbolic elements you put in your works? Do you think you are doing this for your own sake? Is it like a satisfying ritual for you? Uh, she also says that I uh, also think your work influence beyond that knowledge. I think I more or less just answered that question um, already in the sense that um, I think it's important that um, and an art historian with a deep knowledge of the languages of art or an alchemist can, 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 can come to my work in advance of a broken arm, see the, the, the decode the symbolism of the fingers, decode the symbolism of the arms, do some art history, the power, masculinity, all of those things and speak forever. But at the same time, I believe a child can walk into the room and see these arms hanging there and have a valid reaction. I think art should be able to speak equally to people who have the knowledge and also people who don't have the knowledge. Because I think it's also, you know, I try to, in many ways, the emotion comes first, the feeling comes first, the, the channeling comes first, the language comes later. And it's important that one continues to respect that creative process in wh where one is working with things larger than the body, larger than the, our consciousness, in order to open up. Again, I love the, the quote from, from, from uh, William Blake, open the doors of perception. Um, and that art should be able to provide that. You know, when I say that art, the, the African work of art is alive, I mean, I, I know from my own experience standing in front of works of art, I can see when a work of art is alive or dead. It fascinates me. Um, there's certain works of art that, you know, in the past I thought were amazing. I love them. And then at a certain point in time, I'm standing in front of the same work of art that I absolutely love. And I say, it's dead. It's gone. It's something died. Art is also a life force. And 
works of, some works of art are there for 6,000 years. Some works are there for six months. Some works are there, they, they're born dead. Um, you know, it, it, it's important that the work can speak across language, across cultures, across boards. But I don't, I mean, it's not about a universal consciousness because we are we are all different. I'm not going to say we're all the same. I mean, that's that's insane. You know, a person growing up in South Africa or Tehran will have very, very different points of reference, very different experiences. But we will all be able to have empathy on human relations and how how politics or religion influences, senses, predetermines what we can say or can't say. Thanks so much, Kendall. Um, anybody else have any questions? Um, okay, I know uh, that you have this reach uh, and a huge body of work and we can, we can talk for ages about it. I, I, I believe that we all can listen to you for ages about it, but we have to, I guess, wrap it up at some point. Uh, thank you so much for wow. creating this amazing uh, event. Uh, <clears throat> I personally, that was an honor, just listening to you, being with you, having uh, spending time with you. Uh, and thanks for Gazelle for inviting you to this summit. This is amazing. Um, thank you so much, Gazelle, also. Thank you, Kendall. No, yeah. you were. Thank you, Kendall. It's been great. I hope we can have a talk one day with Chota. As, as, great. Thank you very much. But thank you so much. Thank Wonderful. you for your generosity and the lessons. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.